everyone, good morning. Thank you for, so much for being here. My name is Dion Rossiter, and I'm the Executive Director of Science at Cal. Again, thank you so much. Raise your hand if this is your first Science at Cal event. Oh, actually, quite a bit of you. We typically have some kind of mainstream folks who, who help us out and who come on by every month, but we're gonna start today with a land acknowledgement. We're just gonna take a, a few minutes to say that we, Science at Cal and UC Berkeley, recognize that Berkeley sits on the Huchun territory, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign um, Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. Every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. By offering this land acknowledgement, the Berkeley community not only recognizes the history of the land on which we stand, but also recognizes that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. So thank you again for allowing me to take the time to do that. Um, science at Cal celebrates science. We bring the wonder and excitement of UC Berkeley STEM research to the community. Again, all of our events, as you know, you're here. They're all free. They're all geared towards public audience. We have a whole slew of things going on. Uh, we present at lectures, at cafes, at street festivals farmers markets, we're at Cal Day, and we partner with a, a bunch of different people across uh, UC Berkeley, across Oakland, across Berkeley, the East Bay, and broader Bay Area communities. We work with uh, you know, art centers, citizen science projects, things like that all over the place. Um, we really want to thank the folks who are filming today and helping with tech, Berkeley Community Media. If you have any video or recording needs, go to them. So thank you folks in the back. This will be, thank you. This will be online, so uh, stay tuned. If you signed up for us, you'll get it in your inbox. So you'll see it in just a few days as soon as it's finished. Um, and also, um, apparently, if you'd like some slides, you can have those as well, too, if any of these slides are appealing to you as well. Um, I want to also thank the Science at Cal Advisory Council, and interestingly enough, our speaker today is a member of the Science at Cal Advisory Council, so we're in incredibly and eternally grateful for Julia's hard work there, as well as the work she's doing um, at the center. So we want to thank the UC Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost for funding Science at Cal, the Lawrence Hall of Science for managing our program, and also all of our donors, including any of you who've already donated. Um, I want to advocate and encourage you to donate because all of our science is free. Our funding will run out. We don't have a never-ending never supply of funds to keep Science at Cal going, and so we're always looking for opportunities to find partners, to work with foundations, to work with private donors. So come talk to me if you're interested in learning more about how you can uh, possibly sponsor one of these events or a whole series of events. Um, and here are upcoming events. You know, you're here now, so this is the Saturday morning lecture. We have two more in the summer coming up, always on Saturdays in the mornings in this room. We have three Midday Science Cafe events, which is our uh, which is a program that partners with Berkeley Lab, and those are virtual, so you can uh, be anywhere in the world and watch those. Uh, and those feature two early career researchers. Um, this is the one that we have just in a week, June 16th on Thursday, can we make green hydrogen fuel a reality? And as we know, this is, uh, alternative fuel sources are gonna be incredibly important as gas prices continue to soar, so tune into that. We also have our Spanish language program. These are Spanish-speaking scientists who present their research at Oakland Public Library, Cesar Chavez Grants in Fruitvale. We'd love to see you there. Share these uh, opportunities with your community as well. Any Spanish-speaking folks, our family, our colleagues. Um, this is our, the one for June is called The Power of Envi Environmental Awareness and Community from Columbia to UC Berkeley. All right, without further ado, I'm going to introduce 
Julia Shaletsky. She is an interdisciplinary biomedical scientist and entrepreneur, both in the private sector and in academia. She is the executive director of the Center for Emerging and Neglected Disease at UC Berkeley, as well as the Drug Discovery Center and Immunotherapy and Vaccine Research Initiative. After studying biochemistry in her native Germany, she moved to Harvard Medical School for graduate school. Interested in applied science, Dr. Shalesky joined a bio, biotechnology company, uh, Cytokinetics, got it, okay, <laughs> to develop <laughs> new therapies for heart disease and neurodegenerative disorders with several molecules in late stage clinical trials. In her role at UC Berkeley, she focuses on interdisciplinary approaches and public-private partnerships for the discovery and development of new therapies and tools, which you'll learn a lot more about today, particularly for unmet medical needs. Dr. Shaletsky is also a lecturer at the Haas School of Business, teaching bioentrepreneurship, bioentrepre access to medicine, and drug development for neglected disease. She has received an NIH-funded uh, grant to support underrepresented minorities and women in STEM in the U.S. and runs a program in Uganda to build local research capacity. Dr. Shaletsky is broadly interested in global public health, health equity, and the governance of processes that end up influencing who gets care and who does not. So we are so excited to have her today. As I said, she's on our advisory council, so she holds a special place in my heart for volunteering her time, and I'm gonna give the floor over to her. So much. And let's give a hand to Dee and Elisa and the Science at Cal team for hosting us and always doing such a wonderful job getting the excitement of Science at Cal out into the world. Thank you. All right. Oh, oh. Okay, perfect. Subtitles, I don't want subtitles. I'm not familiar with that view. Here, I can see this one. Perfect. So today, I'd like to talk about drug discovery, how we develop new medicines, um, and how people can get access to those. And I really joined UC Berkeley to work on translational science. So translational science deals with the fact, how do we get an innovation that's made in the lab or made in the mind of an inventor into a product that ultimately can benefit people in the marketplace, in the world, you know, patients who are in a hospital or need treatment for disease. So we, we work at UC, um, mostly in the basic science field. So really excellent basic science in biology, chemistry, other areas, and then needs to be translated into patients, into drugs and devices that can benefit people and then another element of translational science I'm really interested in is how do we make sure this actually works in the marketplace where the rubber hits the road. And we work on you know, clinical community, economic, and policy impacts of this type of science. When I joined, I founded the UC Berkeley Drug Discovery Center uh, to ease the step from the lab to the next level um, to take the discovery forward. Um, that didn't really exist at UC Berkeley before, so we have the ability to discover new therapies, small molecules, in a state-of-the-art robotic facility now with about 200,000 small molecules at our disposal, and we work with faculty and collaborate broadly um, to discover new mechanisms and new potential starting points for therapeutics. So we really try to connect academic research and practical implementation of those findings. 
Drug discovery in general, you might have heard about it, how it's done. It starts with a lot of compounds. So you're looking at a large screening effort and then you whittle it down to fewer and fewer candidates. You improve those molecules in a highly iterative fashion. It can take maybe 10, 15 years total um, from the initial idea in a mostly academic lab to a candidate that is ready for a clinical study. And this is because of a variety of things you need to you can't just take any old molecule and put it into people. There's toxic groups there. Some molecules you, you swallow, they won't even go anywhere, so get, just get excreted. Others stay in the blood for a very short time, so it's not useful if it only works for 10 minutes. Um, others stay in the blood for too long, you also don't want that. So all this can be optimized through medicinal chemistry. And that's one reason why um, it's so difficult and so long uh, time to really make drugs, because you need to get all the features. It's like solving for a solution that you need to have has six parallel solutions that have to be solved in order to, um, to be able to use it as a clinical candidate. But this is what companies do, biotech companies, pharmaceutical companies. Um, but in order for them to take the project on, you already need some evidence that it actually does what it's supposed to do, what we call proof of concept. And that's best delivered from the academic setting. And our drug discovery center helps with that. So drug discovery, because of this, takes 15 to 20 years to make a, a drug that really can be used in people. It's also very resource intensive, very costly. So this is, in, you know, in contrast to some other areas of innovation, like tech innovation, where you can do a lot in, in your garage or with a couple of other people and some computers, um, on a short time scale, this is really something where you require infrastructure, you need a team of chemists, you need funding, you need laboratory space where you can work with animals, with chemicals, um, and with biologicals. All this is not something you can easily do at home. So that's why the barriers are relatively high. That's why we need to leverage academic innovation. Um, and also that's why it's so expensive. So the number that is typically quoted by the pharmaceutical industry is about one to two billion dollars is what it costs total to develop one new, me one new medicine. Um, this varies widely though, it really depends on the situation and um, also incorporates a lot of, you know, for some there's like 20 years of basic science before you even get to thinking about a, a medicine because pathways have to be elucidated. That isn't really factored in there. Um, and typically it's distributed, the early work is happening largely in academia. This is also foundational science, this um, curiosity driven basic research without any implementation. Like um, things like Jennifer Doudna did when she de developed CRISPR initially, they were looking at bacteria and how they communicate and how they fight each other. And so th there was really no idea of a medicine at that point. It was basic science, curiosity driven, investigator driven. And then at some point, you know, the aha moment happened, you could use this for something to edit genes and then it was developed. And now we're looking at a whole new area of potentially genetic therapies. So um, this is how, how this pathway normally goes. And all the players have to work together and it costs a lot of money to do that. And the, the funding has to be uh, instilled into the system to do that. So how do we technically discover new drugs? I wanted to give you a bit of a primer because not everybody might, have, might be familiar with it. So there's generally different classes of therapeutics, most familiar small molecules. This is what you get when you buy pills in the pharmacy or you just take an aspirin. Aspirin is shown over here. Really small um, organic chemistry um, design molecule. These can be taken by mouth, so orally they tend to be shelf stable for a long, long time. I mean, my, many of them don't expire, although they have an exp expiration date. Um, and they can get into all parts of your body. They can transverse um, the blood-brain barrier sometimes and cell membranes. Biologics are a newer part of the therapeutic arsenal. So these include antibodies, for example, these generally need to be injected, so you can either have an auto-injector or you have to go to the hospital for some cancer therapies happening. Um, they don't transverse cell membranes, so they stay on, you know, they're limited to certain mechanisms, but there they can work really, really well. 
and they stay in the body for a long time. So we have now, for example, antibodies against migraine that need to be injected once a month. Um, in general, these are more expensive drugs, so these aren't the first-line drugs, but they exist and can be very useful. And then lastly, um, large molecules are peptides. So I'm showing you here the structure of Taxol, which is a well-known cancer drug. This is from the Pacific U tree. You can see, compare that to aspirin up here. Uh, this is a way more complicated molecule, really large, really difficult to synthesize. Originally, when it was found that it works against cancer, um, it had to be prepared from the bark of the yew tree, and they had to cut down a lot of trees and extract it, and still wasn't enough, um, even with all the trees we had for global demand. So a total synthesis of this was achieved from scratch, but it took about five years and 10 academic labs working full power on this just to present different routes to make this from smaller organic chemistry precursors. So that's why um, natural product research is potentially very fruitful, but practically very hard to do you, because you can't really make these molecules very easily. How do we really have to, you know, discover drugs practically speaking? Our process is we identify a molecular target for a specific pathological state. And this is where all the basic research comes in, the curiosity-driven research, the basic biology. The more we know about the body, how it functions, how certain cells function, how it misfunctions in disease, the more we can define hypothesis where you say, okay, we have to turn this screw and then the outcome will be better. And so you identify a molecular target and then express it in a cell system that allows for, the, for analyzing the interaction of the system with, a, with small molecules. And then you basically have a, you know, throw the kitchen sink at it approach where you just randomly try um, you know, hundreds of thousands of molecules, and you see which molecule um, blocks this function of the protein that I want to block, for example. And then you optimize these molecules through medicinal chemistry, um, do animal model and safety studies, and ultimately clinical trials, which, which come in three phases, mostly phase one, two, and three, safety studies, efficacy studies, and the three, phase three is the one that decides if you get FDA approval, and it's a really large, expensive study, and this is also where most of the cost comes, and you remember the previous slide with the triangle, um, the most costly pro pro part of drug development is really clinical development, particularly late stage, because you need so many patients, you need so many clinics and hospitals that work with you, everybody spends at least nine months negotiating contracts, bunch of lawyers, you know, money changes hands. It's very expensive to do these studies. That's, that's one of the reasons why it's so expensive to make new drugs. And I'm always saying, if we find a way to make the trials cheaper, we can make drugs cheaper. But so far, it hasn't been happening because so many people make a nice living off of this. The rocky road to success for drug development also has to be mentioned. So um, only 10% of drugs ever make it, so the vast majority of, of attempts fail, and it's really a frustrating thing sometimes, developing new medicines, because you get one step further just to have it fail there. So it's, it's very iterative. It, it, it needs a lot of skill and experience and expertise, um, but it can be done. And I'm going to show you now some examples of transformational therapeutics that have been developed um, with involvement of Cal. So the first example I want to talk about is cancer immunotherapy. Who has heard of cancer immunotherapy? Yeah, some people. So it's, it's got a, bunch, a, a bit of press, and, and rightfully so. Um, so this shows you a survival curve. I don't know if you're familiar with this, this slightly depressing way um, of looking at um, um, it's, it's survival, so here's, everybody's alive, these are all patients, and then people slowly pass away, and you can see, you know, over time, most people with this cancer here will, will die. Um, but if you treat with immunotherapy, so normally uh, the treatments we had before would do from the, from the red to the yellow to, to some extent, so you would get some more time, but ultimately, also, if you have severe cancer, you will pass away. So immunotherapy is unique in being represented by the blue curve. 
Um, as you can see, it's not up here, so it's not like it cures everybody, but it cures a portion of people, and I want to emphasize really cures them. So instead of, you know, just delaying the cancer's progression, um, people treated with immunotherapy are cancer-free, basically, for the rest of a prolonged life. So it's the first time an actual cure for cancer was described and not just like a delay of the progression um, that unfortunately is mostly seen. So how is that achieved? Immunotherapy was discovered right here at UC Berkeley by Jim Allison. He's now at uh, MD Anderson, but when he made the discovery, he was here. And he looked at, um, you know, how the cancer can hide from the immune system. And what he discovered is that if you take away the ability for the cancer to hide from the immune system, the immune system will actually recognize that the cancer is somewhat different from the normal tissue in, in your body and start attacking it. And like that, you can, you can eradicate the cancer. And so he used antibodies to do that because in immunology there are these receptors, they interact, and so the cancer cell binds the T cell, it's an immune cell, and thereby it kind of hides. But if you block that interaction, then the T cell is free to float around um, and ultimately can start the immune response and um, eradicate the cancer. So Jim Allison um, uh, received the Nobel Prize in 2018 for that in invention that ultimately gave us drugs like in the curve that I showed you before, like ipilimumab, hard to pronounce, but um, it cures cancer for about 20 to 30 percent of patients, which is really stunning, um, and is now being developed as combination therapy with other drugs where the success rate is even higher. I highly recommend, if you have time, to watch this documentary. It's called Jim Allison Breakthrough. Um, it's available for free now. If you Google it, you'll, you'll, you'll find a link to watch it in streaming. Um, and it shows you the whole path of how this drug was discovered and all the obstacles that had to be overcome that were numerous. I mean, nobody believed, you know, as with many things, um, in the beginning, nobody believed this could work. And Jim was considered a bit crazy and had to push forward against so many obstacles um, to bring this drug to patients. And it's now, to patients, it's now truly a life changer. And um, this film I highly recommend um, walks you through the, through the story. It's a documentary. It's not boring. It's very exciting to watch. So I would, I would recommend you take a look at this. Um, and since everybody had breakfast, I want to show you a, <laughs> a picture from, from colon cancer that just came out this week where, because they're still developing immunotherapy in new combinations. And this was now a small trial of 18 patients with a mismatch repair defect um, that had really bad colorectal cancer, as you can see here and here. And they get this treatment, and within three months, the cancer is gone for 18 out of 18 patients. Right? So this is like unheard of response rate and six months as well, super clean results. So it's, it's fascinating, you know, how much uh, of a difference this drug makes and the side effect profile is relatively reasonable and it's, it really has opened up a completely new way to treat cancer that is highly successful by exploiting your own immune system and that really gets us from this mindset of resection where you just can cut out an early cancer and otherwise you kind of fail um, to immunotherapy where the immune system then discovers it wherever it is in your body, including the metastases. So the outlook is a lot better. So this was one great success and um, I think collectively uh, Berkeley researchers are still proud that this happened here. <laughs> um, the starting point for that and uh, that Jim was kind of also bullheaded enough to really push this through and develop it despite all the naysaying, right? Because with innovation, it's very interesting. In hindsight, it all seems like it's a natural progression, but when, when you make the discovery and you push it forward, there's so many people that say, no, this can never work, and, why would, and you don't get the funding because they believe it won't work, and things like that. So um, he pushed through, and now we got a really new, interesting, exciting therapeutic option. Um, the second case study I want to talk about is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So um, this is a disease, heart disease, that is relatively prevalent uh, 
in, in kids, in young people, and really also fit athletes. And here you can see uh, Reggie Lewis, who passed away, sadly, from HCM on the field. So this is the, the, the thing that happens to when athletes play a game, and then suddenly they drop dead in the middle of the field, and nobody knows what happens. Um, it's very often HCM. So I'm showing you here um, the heart. Uh, normal heart looks like this, you know, section through it. And in HCM, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy means the muscle is thickened abnormally in some areas. And the heart, and this is because the heart contracts too much, so it's kind of an overactive muscle. If you think about the heart, it needs to be nicely in balance between contraction and relaxation because it's a pump. It needs to be able to fill when it's opening up and then squeeze the blood out to get it moving. Um, if you have too much contraction, that causes problems, and if you have too little contraction as well. So HCM is a disease that had absolutely no therapeutic option. There, what I mean, you can discover this by echo, and you can also discover it ge through genetic screening. Um, and the only recommendation that was given to these mostly young athletes is to just don't, don't do sports and be very sedentary because every time they run, there will be a risk that they overexert and they, they basically die. So you had to have, um, so they actually recommend golf to these people as a treatment. So that, <laughs> that's, the, that's the, the, the only thing you could do, right? I'm going to try to show you this video. Let's see if this works, maybe. The heart is a beating muscle that continually pumps blood to the lungs and organs of the body. Inside the heart are four chambers, two upper chambers or atria and two lower chambers or ventricles. The ventricular septum is the muscle which separates the two ventricles. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, HCM, is a genetic heart disease where there is increased thickness of the left ventricle, predominantly affecting the ventricular septum. There are two types of HCM, non-obstructive and obstructive. Obstructive HCM occurs when the mitral valve makes an abnormal motion and contacts the thickened septum, obstructing the flow of blood from the left ventricle out of the heart, as well as causing leakiness or regurgitation of blood back into the left atrium. This right, so this explains you what happens during HCM. I think it, it's really nice to see it in the video. Um, and as I said, no therapeutic option. Wait. Okay. And I had the good fortune um, to work on this project and help develop a solution to this devastating disease that's actually relatively prevalent but often unrecognized in the population. So we, we realized, you know, when I was still working at cytokinetics, that too much contraction in this case is a bad thing because it causes these problems with blood flow. And uh, the company I was working with was focused on muscle therapeutics, strengthening mostly um, muscle contraction. But in this case, we thought maybe if we just mellow out the contraction a bit and renormalize it, um, there could be therapeutic benefit for patients. So try to inhibit the contraction. And we had developed, you know, a, mech, a, a way to look at the sarcomere, which is the contractile unit in the muscle of heart and skeletal and other muscles, um, in a dish, in a reconstituted fashion. And so that allowed us um, to actually interrogate our chemical library of a couple hundred thousand compounds and see which molecules do the thing we want them to do, which is to just make the contraction a bit weaker. So we did this biochemical screen um, and identified compounds that had the desired phenotype that were, were then um, acquired by myocardia, who developed them quite masterfully, did all the lead optimization and, um, de and clinical development, preclinical development into phase two, and they were then acquired by Bristol Myers Squibb. And the drug just recently got FDA approved. It's now called Chemzios. Um, and it's used in patients, and it's our first therapeutic option we've ever had for HCM. And the way it, it was discovered was from understanding the mechanism of, 
of the sarcomere, how it works, and having a, a real, this was real hypothesis-driven research, trying to understand, you know, how the heart muscle contracts and how we can optimize it uh, in a way to get the desired outcome for patients. And the mechanism of action, if you look on the really microscopic level, is a normal sarcomeres. These little heads are like the engines. They pull the muscle together so it contracts. In HCM, you have too many of those engaged, so the contraction is too hard. And then with the modulation, with, with the drug Mavacamptin, uh, it normalized that back to the normal level. And patients can now, are now free to exercise and do just live normal lives and don't have to worry that they uh, drop dead because of HCM so quickly. So it was a really great success story. First in class, this drug didn't exist. Nothing existed to treat this disease. So I'm always excited about that because in the pharma industry, there's also, um, there's also a movement that's driven by patent protection um, to rehash what you already did 10 years ago and just make really, really minor changes and then submit it again as a new drug with a new patent and a new packaging and a new name. And, you know, that, that to me isn't that exciting. You know, I think we, we need real innovation, um, drugs that change lives to treat diseases that you just couldn't treat before. And there's another story here I want to share, molecular glues. So I've just shown you a, a disease in HCM where an enzyme or a, a motor that's overactive needs to be inhibited. But there's many diseases where you don't have an activity that needs to be inhibited, but it's just caused by proteins that are just there, hanging out and, um, in the wrong place at the wrong time. For example, brain disease can be caused by proteins that form aggregates, clumps in cells, and then start destroying the neurons where they're in. Um, and also proteins can be a switch um, that tells a cell to keep growing in cancer, for example. So here the idea would not be to inhibit some function because there isn't really a function in that sense, um, but you could have the idea to take them out of the cell, maybe remove them or sequester them, somehow put them in a box and be done with these proteins. So how can you achieve this? And this can be achieved through molecular glues. So the, the idea here is that instead of inhibiting, like with a hard drug, like where you would do something like this, you have a small molecule that binds into an active site, um, you would have a small molecule that glues your problem protein to another protein, and then together they get removed, for example, from the system. So it's like a search and destroy mechanism. You could also compare it to uh, like a litter picker. Like it, it gets the can, which is the, the bad protein, to stick to the litter picker and then it can be removed from the cell. So this idea was commercialized based on idea here at Cal by Micha Rappe uh, together with John Curran and Art Weiss. And, um, you know, Micha is in the audience today, so it was really a great idea that didn't exist before. We have a lot of molecular glue therapeutics companies now. This has developed into a big field, but at the time, this was a really new, somewhat crazy idea as well. Started at Cal, um, got advanced through collaboration, through mentorship of uh, people here who helped raise the funds. Initial seed funding was very critical to get proof of concept for the idea. Um, the company formed, uh, went public in 2020, now employs actually 300 people, has four clinical programs and early stage trials and promising results already in cancer. So also here, completely new mechanism, uh, mechanism innovation that wasn't here before um, and now you know, hopefully will get developed into feasible therapeutics for cancer. This is still relatively young, so it takes some time to get approval, but very, very exciting story as well from UC Berkeley. So this is how I told you a bit how drug discovery is done, some stories of um, success, how we could really, how academic research was informing public-private partnership and then um, ultimately developing of new therapies and, and up to approval. And in the second part of my talk, I want to talk a bit about the financial drivers for innovation and also what we can do if these financial drivers fail. So generally, because 
it all comes back to the large cost of drug development that I talked about in the beginning. The, um, you need a lot of investment in order to get to approval because if you think you develop a product, let's say some kind of um, some you know regular use um, consumer good product, you would have maybe half a year of development or a year of development, then you have a prototype, you develop a product, you make it cheaper, and then you start selling. In, in drug discovery and development, uh, this process takes about 10 to 20 years until you can even think about starting to sell. So you need a lot of money to keep you going um, and do the research, the expensive clinical trials in the first 10 to 20 years before you make money back and then you know, can survive, basically. So for that, you need investors, and investors only get excited if they get a return on investment. So it comes from different sources. In the big, so here's a time scale. Initially, you just sink money into the company. There's no product. So um, in biotech, you know, large majority of biotech companies we have in South San Francisco are what we call pre-revenue. So they basically do research to develop their candidate. They, they have nothing to sell, so they don't really get money back. Um, it's just, you know, uh, just an investment at this point. So there's funding uh, from NIH, government entities, BARDA, you know, different foundations, also philanthropic foundations. But the really biggest component for um, the ecosystem for biotech startups are venture capitalists who invest in series A, B, C funding rounds um, and then, um, you know, push the company all the way to uh, initial public offering when they then go on the stock market and raise uh, money through a financing. And also what I would call profitable pharma, the large pharma who already has returns from other projects and now starts some new ones where they're still investing, um, they also invest into partnerships and they buy smaller companies to replenish their internal pipeline. But this is where the money comes from. And this works very well for areas that have large financially lucrative markets. For example, cancer um, or you know, heart disease. Heart disease is still the number one killer of Americans. So um, there is, uh, there, there's a way how you can basically um, get reimbursement for these drugs. Um, and if you have a value that's added, um, you can basically justify a return at the end of the day that pays back all these venture capitalists and other investors that have invested over 10 to 20 years. However, there's areas where this doesn't really work and this is then called a market failure. So I have one example here, um, neglected tropical diseases. And the, you, know, you can look over those. The point really is, hopefully you'll agree that majority of those you've never heard about. And this is, has a reason. And the reason is that they don't really, have, these diseases don't affect us here in the United States. So on the left, you can see the world map and the burden of these diseases is largely in Africa, South America. And why is this a market failure? Because if it affects people, in principle, you would think we could develop things and sell a cure um, to these people. But if you look at the healthcare spending globally, it's highly concentrated in the US mostly, you know, and also in Europe and some other countries. So it's a complementary picture to this. So the, the disease burden is in areas where there's barely any spending, and that's exactly why the market can't really fix this. Because you can't, you know, after investing 10, 20 years, you can't really generate enough revenue to financially justify that investment. But this is not to be said that can't be done. So how can you develop drugs for people who can't pay, basically? And this includes now more and more people over here also, not, not just in Africa. Um, one way is to make it cheaper to develop, right? So initially, instead of having this huge uh, bulging cost sink, you could make it cheaper, including pro bono drug discovery. That's something that's actually pretty frequently done. I myself have worked on projects like this. Um, there's philanthropy also, the Gates Foundation, others. Um, but also important is less regulation. So one reason why clinical trials are so expensive is also the regulatory burden, the fact that law firms are involved. All this, all this costs money, right? So if you really want to develop something on a shoestring budget, um, that can be simplified. Particularly for a setting where 
Right now, there's absolutely no therapy, or people, you know, are dying in large numbers. Um, so then, you know, we have a focus on safety and regulation that is a bit mismatched with that scenario. So that's one way. The other way is to increase revenue in different ways to make it more lucrative. Um, and there, you know, really successful is to find government payers versus individuals um, and also have conglomerates of countries all chipping in together to say, for example, we need a vaccine against this disease um, instead of everybody you know, just waiting until it shows up and then buying it, we will say, like, if you can develop a vaccine that works, we will buy 200 million doses, like, all countries together, right? So that works really well um, and has been done through an organization called Gavi, for example. You combine buying power. Um, and then also FDA and policy and patent incentives can really make a difference here um, in a way almost wouldn't believe. Like the FDA has a priority review voucher for neglected tropical diseases that has been really successful in encouraging people um, you know, to at least help them raise funds for indications that normally wouldn't financially be financially viable. And also, you know, orphan disease belongs to this area too, where uh, policy changes have really made a difference. Um, all right. So it can be done. You know, it's a lot, I think uh, these days it's kind of creeping into the conversation. Always it's almost unseen, but people almost start to believe that you can't do anything that's not lucrative in the end. And that's not true. So um, we have, uh, you know, successful examples where even in the context of market failure, you can develop the, uh, vaccines and therapeutics that work well and that save so many lives, and it's totally doable. So, for example, meningitis A is a great, great example. So here you see the meningitis belt. This is a disease that mostly affects tropical, um, equatorial Africa. Um, didn't affect us in the US at all. And, but a lot of kids died um, regularly in Africa. It moved in waves, a really, really horrible disease. Most families affected by it. And a consortium was formed uh, between the World Health Organization, PATH, the India Serum Institute, Gavi, Gates Foundation, many other players with competent and mission-driven leadership. Um, and they were able um, to develop a vaccine that was rolled out in 2010 for less than 50 cents per dose, really cheap. Um, and that was then, you know, globally distributed in Africa. And at this point, more than 300 million people have been vaccinated and meningitis A is eliminated from this area. So it was huge success. And, you know, PATH wrote that in just 10 days, nearly every person in Burkina Faso between 1 and 29 was vaccinated against meningitis in 10 days. So, so contrast that to our own COVID vaccine debacle. Kind of, it's, it's interesting to see how things can be done if everyone really wants them to be done. And um, Art Reingold here was part of that too. He is a professor at the School of Public Health. And he told me how it was being in Africa, being part of the vaccination campaign. And he said people would walk for three or four days to get the shot and you know, bring their whole family, because so many people had lost children to this disease. It was a, a huge, like, it was, people were eternally grateful for that vaccine to be there. And this is what happens if you develop a vaccine against a truly deadly disease, because everybody will come running. So they got, within 10 days, basically full vaccination of the young population. So this can not only be done for vaccines. Vaccines generally are relatively cheap to make, you know, so people go, well, you know, it's easier, but can also be done for therapeutics. So I have here a good example of Ebola therapeutics. Um, the risk of Ebola infection, infection very much limited to certain parts of equatorial Africa. Horrible disease, sometimes you have 90% mortality with certain strains, so contrast that to the COVID mortality, and um, it, it's, it's very, very, very difficult. I mean, you, you just get close to someone and basically it's a death sentence. Um, there, people also developed together um, between DOD, BARDA, Gates, Welcome Trust, and importantly, the Canadian government uh, developed a program and tried to develop cures and vaccines for this. This was also because um, 
it was considered a, a threat for the Department of Defense, and there was, you know, in Japan, there was a, a subway attack, and everybody was getting worried about Ebola. But if you look at the story, there was maybe five billion, maybe two billion invested. It's, it's difficult to say at the end of the day for all kinds of research. But what really moved the needle for the Ebola therapeutic was $200,000 of Canadian government funding. And this is a really interesting story. You know, Heinz Feldman was uh, the guy who, re who really innovated the ther therapeutic and had the finding. And he was in a lab in Canada. But right now, he's at the Rocky Mountain Labs in Colorado running our high security facility there um, for BSL-4 pathogens. A really good guy. But he was, um, he was di discovering this in Canada and you know, convinced the Canadian government to give him some funding to, to continue this line of research. And I just want to say that this is, you know, Canada has no Ebola, right? So for, for them, this was like, and the person who approved the funding went out on a limb a bit to do this because, you know, it's really difficult to say why Canadian tax money should pay for Ebola fund, but, but it did and it really moved the needle. This is what what seeded and what started the therapy we have now, the only therapy currently approved against the Zaire portion of the Ebola virus. So the Ebola is, is also a good example of relatively little money can actually make a big difference. And if you think five billion is a lot, it's true, it's a lot of money. Um, but if you just think, you know, the West span of the Bay Bridge, it was $6.7 billion. Right? So this is how you can put it in perspective. This saves a lot of lives. Um, and, you know, it's, it's in a very limited funding that has to be invested once, and then you have a solution at least you can use in theory. And also, diagnostics are really important. These often get the short shaft because you can make as much money with them. A working diagnostic is just PCR, it's super simple to do. Um, I talked to a doctor who was in Africa during this last Ebola outbreak where 90% of people die who get it, and he was running a big like tent city where all the patients were brought. And he said the thing that made the biggest difference for them was to have the PCR up and running because when he came for one month, they had no PCR machine. They just had to look at the patients and say, well, you could have Ebola. You have to be quarantined. You have to go into this tent with the other Ebola patient. Um, but later when they did PCR, it turns out that only about half of the patients that came in actually had Eb Ebola. So you can do the math what this means for the guy who has a kind of flu or something that has a similar phenotype, and then suddenly you put him in the tent with the actual Ebola patient, right? So this is how a diagnostic can be critical for making sure we treat patients correctly. So I'm looking at all this and go like, can we rest on our laurels, right? We have the drug discovery engine clearly humming, particularly here in the Bay Area. Funds are invested. We have uh, VCs who want to, um, you know, spin out startups, you know. Um, we can use creative and feasible approaches for neglected and rare diseases and, and also market failure like antibiotic resistance is another big one that we are working on now. We can solve a lot of things, but, you know, the thing that I'm always asking, uh, being here and talking to a lot of people, is how useful is a cure if the patient can't get it? So I'm also really interested in that implementation part. So the last part of this wheel of translational science that I've shown you in the first slide, because we can do all the innovation and come up with something really good, but then if it can't reach people because it's too expensive or they just can't get access to it, you know, it's very frustrating for the scientists. I mean, what, what good does it do on a shelf somewhere, right? So we have a lot of barriers of, to access here in California, the US, and in the world also. Um, monopolies, misregulation, and greed are the three big ones, I feel, um, that, that cause this. Uh, currently, in California, uh, most markets are highly concentrated. I mean, particularly hospital markets are now completely monopolized. Dialysis market is completely monopolized. It's one company doing 85% of the dialysis in the United States. So that company has power. Like if they say, I don't like regulation, I'm shutting down 85% of dialysis, like a lot of patients will be, you know, in, in dire straits. So the monopolization is a real problem. You know, we have more and more mergers. Uh, recently, we've had more and more private equity investments in emergency rooms, in 
hospitals, about 25% of hospitals are now owned by investors. 65% um, of emergency rooms are owned by investors. So, I mean, you don't have to be particularly jaded to know that the decision making is going to be different long term. If, uh, if the point is to return uh, revenue to the investor versus to treat people, right? So it's a completely different mission and is happening without any uh, significant antitrust action, um, unfortunately. So the, the antitrust is instead focusing on small biotechs merging, which I, mean, it, I think doesn't make a lot of sense. But I'll walk through them um, now, you know, step by step. One big one is drug pricing, and that gets probably most of the press and a lot of attention. We have no direct regulation in the United States. Companies get to set prices freely. This is really a lone position uh, within all develop developed country countries. Most people, most countries have some kind of negotiation in place with the drug makers to have reasonable prices. But then also the, the US is also the global innovation engine. It can't be denied. I mean, mo most drugs come from here and it's also because um, they can charge what they want and so more interest in investing in this space. So prices are, are about double here than for everyone else, for example, in Canada or other countries. Um, and there are indirect mechanisms for control. So if the prices are way too high, then the insurers won't cover it. Medicare won't reimburse it as we just had for, this, um, for, for um, a drug in the neurospace. Um, and there will be no business. So in a way, it's, there's some regulation, but it's indirect. Um, and there is a lot of debate about this. And I think clearly the prices have to go down. The increase has been exponential over the next, uh, last five to 10 years, so too much. Um, but drugs, we also, if you talk about the healthcare system as, as a whole, we also need to remember that drugs only account for 15% of the healthcare cost in the US. So if you think about all the talk about it, it's actually a, a relatively small sliver. Um, the majority of cost is in healthcare delivery. So about half is hospitals alone, um, you know, also senior living and, you know, doctors, the whole, should, the, you know, the whole thing. So 15% is drugs. The value needs to be considered. I think we have to have a nuanced discussion. Um, some drugs are really overpriced for what they do. If you think about just maybe increasing your quality of life a tiny bit or having maybe two, a couple more weeks life expectancy, it's not, not such a big, de big deal. Um, something, you know, on the other hand, some of the therapies we're talking about that being developed where you could get one infusion and then be cured for life, I mean, that to me would justify a higher price. Um, also, rebates are given for drug prices, but currently, you know, never reach the patients because we have the system of pharmacy benefit managers that skim it off. So how this works, I'm simplifying here a little bit because this is really something you have to be an accountant to fully, fully penetrate. But um, they negotiate the copay and what is actually covered by the insurance, so the, between the insurer and the patient. Um, and what happens, for example, is the pharmacy buys a drug with a rebate from the wholesaler. They end up paying $3 for it. Um, then you go in, you have your prescription, um, you want to get that drug. The copay that the pharmacy benefit manager negotiated with your, your insurance company is $15. So you end up paying 15 in the pharmacy, but the pharmacy only pays three for the drug. So the difference is split between the pharmacy and the pharmacy benefit manager, and you end up holding the bag. So that's currently done um, almost everywhere. It's so complicated that the government was kind of asleep at the wheel, I think, a bit. They're now discussing this. So I think eventually there will be limits imposed, but right now, this is a free for all where, they, where you know, people skim off the rebates that could be given to patients. And ultimately, you pay more than the pharmacy pays for the drug. So it's like it's almost a revenue generating tool. Not surprisingly, three big players again monopolize the market for pharmacy benefit manager. And one of them is actually CVS, who's also running the pharmacy. So it's like one is, you know, dealing, self dealing is, is very much happening here. And, um, a system of cartel pricing um, that doesn't benefit um, patients. 
And then insurance and payers, and I put the quotation marks in really in on purpose here because recently I've talking to people who've had covered California, for example, I, I feel the, the so-called payers aren't really paying very much at all. Um, there's no effective regulation, uh, monopolization of the market, also for the insurers. Um, insurers can decide what they want to cover and reimburse. And that is really something you, you, sh you should let sit for a minute because it's kind of, it doesn't make any sense. This is nobody, no other country does that. Um, normally, you would want your insurance company to make these decisions based on medical necessity, like whatever is medically necessary should be covered. But in the US, they can decide what they want to cover. And this is a classical case of the fox guarding the hen house. And nobody can fully understand and penetrate this. Even if you're a doctor, you think you'll get good care if you have whatever rare cancer that you can predict you might get. But then only when you get it, you will actually realize what they cover, what new drug will be in the formulary, or maybe not accessible to you because it's the wrong plan. And, you know, this is uh, really not a tenable situation um, at all. And also the other thing that's happening in principle, there's government entities that's supposed to look out for that, but I, I think they just don't. Uh, no one stops insurance companies from making your life really difficult. Even the things they're supposed to cover and they have to eventually cover, they, they still make it really hard for you. You have to be on the phone, you know, for hours without end, and you have to appeal, and, you know, I have a friend who is a, a, a professor of medicine in Stanford, and she has a chronic disease got it covered every year until this year they just decide not to cover. She has, to, I mean, the fight she has to put up until they actually cover is, is, is stunning. And she is someone who really knows this field and knows, uh, knows what needs to be done. But um, if a regular person who works two jobs is supposed to do this, I, I don't know, it's just impossible. So um, I think um, patients are being failed here. They, they don't really get their money's worth. Um, and also there's rampant false advertising a lot of insurance companies offer you a bunch of in-network doctors with great degrees and, and great Yelp reviews. And then once you commit to buying the insurance, you'll find out that none of, you, none of them take new patients. And that's a huge issue um, um, currently, particularly with Covered California. Um, so there is a lot of formally insured people now, so everybody can say everybody has insurance. But in fact, um, not much will be covered or no one will accept the insurance and in the end you just can't get the medical care you need. And you know, if it's just something you have a, a well visit, maybe not such a big deal, but if you have some urgent issue um, and you can't be seen by a provider, this can cause significant issues for us as a society too because we know if we don't treat the problem early, it becomes a bigger problem and also more expensive problem. And then lastly, providers. So providers guard also their monopolies fiercely. Um, prescription mandate, for example. Um, strong pushback was given to allow even licensed pharmacists to prescribe COVID drugs, for example, in the pandemic, um, which is a, a thing that absolutely makes sense. Paxlovid needs to be given as soon as possible when you have the infection. If you even wait three days until your provider finally has an appointment and writes the script or answers your email, this is uh, time wasted. You know, the patient needs to get the drug immediately. So it makes a lot of sense, but that didn't go down so smoothly. So um, it was a bit of a fight. Luckily, in this case, government pushed back hard, and then within two days, American Medical Association completely changed their tune and was okay with it. But, you know, there, there was for sure some stuff going on um, to make happen, to make this happen behind the scenes. Um, we have a situation also in the U.S. right now with the insurance issues that, you know, the cost of a drug might not be the limiting thing. For example, a generic drug like an antibiotic, I was just giving a talk about a case like this, um, may cost just $2 in a pharmacy, but if you're uninsured, you can't get the prescription. So in order to get the prescription, you need to see a provider who charges you 300 bucks. If you don't have that money, there's just no option. Right. So um, you can't go to the pharmacy, get a prescription there. You need to see a provider. And what that, what that leads to, practically speaking, is that a lot of the working poor and poor people in California that are, don't, you know, are eligible for Medicaid because it's so low, it's like 18K a year. If you make more than that, you're not eligible. Um, 
but you're still poor in the Bay Area, so many of them are forced to buy prescription drugs off the street, and we see actually significant increases this year in mortality uh, because often the drugs they buy are fake and often now they're laced with fentanyl and then you take something which you think is your usual drug or blood pressure medication or painkiller and then you get respiratory depression and you die. And it's actually happening. It's not covered much, but the data is clear and it's out there, epidemiological data. So there are significant ethical issues, I think, around limiting access to life-saving medicines for the most vulnerable, just to protect business of licensed providers, because that's really what's happening um, here. Instead of saying, for example, if I have a, a clear case of a bacterial infection, a pharmacist can just dispense a generic antibiotic. So it's very interesting because I work in Uganda too, and there it's you know this low and middle income country, nobody has insurance. Majority of people never see a doctor in their life. But for certain diseases, um, if they get it, they just go to the pharmacy and get the drug and they're done. So it's actually in some ways easier than it's here where the barriers are so high for people. All right, and then lastly, my favorite, misguided trade policy. It like, has nothing to do with science and really like, causes major, major is issues. So American citizens are not allowed to buy prescription drugs abroad and import into the US, even with a prescription. So FDA has enforcement discretion, so if you go buy insulin in Canada and you bring it in the plane, probably they won't do much, but it's formally not legal. You can't, that's why it's so hard to order online. Um, there was an executive order to allow this that got rescinded, Interesting also, that didn't get much coverage. Um, and I think personally this is you know, a significant ethical violation for the underinsured or un uninsured. And we have many underinsured now that have insurance, but the insurance just won't pay for much or does, you have huge co-pays. So it's a bit like you have a famine in the country and you don't allow anyone to bring food into the country from outside because the nutrition label isn't exactly up to snuff in this country. So this is exactly what's happening. And that was one of the main contributors also to the recent infant formula shortage crisis that we had. We lost one supplier in the US um, and, we were, and you know, it's kind of expected to lose a supplier every now and then. But we couldn't replenish from outside because FDA didn't allow import, importation of high quality formula. Even if it was from the same supplier originally made and exported, they wouldn't allow it um, because of trade policy. So this is something to be aware of as well. And not surprisingly, what all this does is for us that we end up paying a lot more than everybody else. We pay about double for healthcare uh, in aggregate and we get you know, less in terms of life expectancy and quality of care on average. But I want to add on a, end on a positive note. You know, COVID um, brought much needed change into this ossified system because suddenly things were possible that nobody would have thought even possible because of all the special interests. So we can do now telehealth across state lines, which is usually beneficial to patients. If you can't afford to go to a doctor here, you can have telehealth with a doctor in Nevada for $30, $40. You can get a prescription if you need it. It's not, I wouldn't say this is the highest quality care imaginable, but at least it's a step, right? Um, we also saw you know, a previously unimaginable empowerment of providers, that licensed, trained providers, like pharmacists, nurse practitioners, who have now more bandwidth to prescribe and treat people. Um, diagnostics are accessible now directly to patients in some cases. I think that should be expanded. Um, something we struggled with even here at Cal, trying to do COVID testing initially. We were able to do the testing, tell people, you know, know if people had the virus, but you weren't allowed to tell people because only doctors are allowed to tell people. So that clearly doesn't make any sense. Um, and you know, some of this was changed during the pandemic and really moved into a better place. 
And government also took effective action in, in many ways, so I feel they kind of uh, maybe came into their own a bit here, seeing that actually difference can be made, you know. Operation Warp Speed was really successful, Remdesivir pricing and availability also I think was well done. Um, making sure the insurers have to cover COVID tests, right, it was, it was pretty meaningful for the American population um, to get free testing most of the time. And just recently we got more traction around the pharmacy benefit manager issue and um, there's some hearings and I hope um, you know people will intervene and make sure that you know the, the rebates have to reach the patients at the end of the day so in California also there's relatively small and cheap changes that could make life significantly better for the uninsured for example it's very doable um, we have a you know hundred billion dollar surplus right now interestingly it's not done but I think we need to push to, to get some of these things done because it's a, th that would really move the lead, needle for some of the poorest people's lives. So, to sum it all up, to get drugs discovered, developed, and then into the hands of people to treat disease, all parts have to work together, all parts have to be accountable, and also the funds have to align with the mission, and the mission is really to treat people for a reasonable price and make sure we have less morbidity and less mortality in the population. Thank you. All right. All right, thank you so much. I'm actually gonna let you run your own Q&A, so All if right. you could just raise up your hand and Julia will need to repeat the question so okay. that it's all, um, so everyone can hear and also it's recorded in the, for the camera. So go ahead. Please. Yes. So what's my opinion? So if, if the um, government military basically model can be applied uh, to drug discovery and development of therapeutics, right? So um, that's the question, pa paraphrasing. I, th I think there are lessons to be learned from the military model. I thought actually, particularly in the pandemic, uh, it would have helped to have you know, some kind of decision making more aligned with a war situation you know, because um, I mean, we, we already lost more people than we lost in World War II, but still the decision making was like, well, you know, every, every local community can make their own call and um, some do this, some do that, you know. So it, it seemed to me the uh, alignment um, that could have been required, I mean, they, they could have pushed that a bit harder. Also the Defense Production Act, you know, was invoked just very recently for the formula shortage of all things, but not during the COVID pandemic <laughs> for a COVID therapeutics. So I feel, you know, I think it's fundamentally a completely different group of people. You know, we like, in, in public health, the decision making is very different. We have uh, people who study this effective, you know, very deeply, um, but I think at the same time, public health, people aren't the one who should make the political decisions, right? And then um, in, in the defense department, it's a different type of decision making in crisis. You know, they're kind of more trained to respond in a crisis with the best decision they can make with the data they have versus going back and say like, we need more data and we need more studies and until then we just won't decide, right? Uh, and this is a lot of what I've seen in the pandemic where it's just like we try to decide a little bit like this and a little bit like this, where, but not in a decisive way um, because we we kind of af afraid of making a call and it could be wrong, right? And so I think this is something I, I've actually argued that um, a pandemic should be considered more a national security crisis and also set in place and into motion some of these decision-making processes where you can be more decisive and um, you know, push things forward uh, with less local control and from on a more state and federal level. 
Um, but for the development itself, you know, of new therapeutics, I have to say, you know, Department of Defense and BARDA, they are involved in funding early things. Um, I would say the difference there is the, the, um, the way they give out funding has a different model, and I think that fills an important niche because it's, um, they, they are allowed to take larger risks with the money. The National Institute of Health is super conservative, and they won't really fund anything un unless you can already you show half of the project has already been done and it works, right? So that makes it very difficult. Um, for example, also in the COVID pandemic, NIH took very long to actually disperse funding to researchers. It wasn't happening for a long, long time. Um, and it's just counteracting their regular model of incremental progress, right? So that BARDA and DOD, they're a bit more like uh, if the the, the program managers have a lot of power, so it depends on the program manager, right? If the program manager is randomly interested in some whatever app development or something, then they will only fund this. Um, but if they, you know, if they have you know good alignment, they can allocate funding relatively freely and fund high-risk um, pro programs more quickly. So there is definitely. Um, some value in that. I think all, think all groups have to collaborate, but certainly some things we have to, we can learn. I think the, the incremental funding model is a bit um, behind the times because we have to have some way to test new ideas, you know, and understanding 90% of them will fail, but ultimately you still have to give it a shot if you're in a pandemic particularly. So um, I, I think we, we, we kind of, penny wise and pound foolish sometimes, the way we apply uh, resources to research funding, because people are very careful with like every $10,000 and you have to uh, write a lot of paperwork and think about, uh, will this really work? Although certainty can be given, but for other programs, the government spends money in, in big amounts, and nobody cares, right? It's like, so it's, you know, to me this is, is like a bit, the focus is a bit wrong, right? I think we, we just have to say in order to do good research to find fundamentally new things, we have to support basic curiosity-driven inquiry. And even if this is something weird that where you don't see a point right now, um, there might be a point 10 years from now. I mean, famously, there was, an, uh, I think, congressional inquiry in why we spend tax money on understanding the lipid metabolism of polar bears, and that was ridiculed everywhere. They go like, why would you study polar bears? And that's a waste of money. And then, you know, years later, it became the starting point for a new level, way of lowering cholesterol because polar bears actually live off of fat during the cold months largely. And, you know, if a human would do that, we would all have, a, you know, heart disease and die. So the question how they deal with this is actually pretty important for our health, but it's sometimes not obvious um, to, to the lawmakers. I, I think this money just has to be allocated in the big picture you know, what we the, the research funding we give is relatively small to many other things we do um, in our federal, federal budget. So I think it would be good to allow people to take a bit more risks with their research. Right. Yes? Uh -huh. Ah, okay. Who, do we, I, I'm not so familiar with it. Who's funding it? Do you uh, know where it's, where it's coming from? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, GSK, GSK I, I'm sure they can do some good work. I, I think it's exciting to see public-private partnership. I'm sometimes a bit hesitant <laughs> to be super excited about things that just want to push a certain technology like artificial intelligence or using large data sets or something like that because uh, we've also seen this in the pandemic that sometimes you know, just because you could use whatever supercomputing doesn't really need, mean that the result is going to be great, right? So you have to be able to match the technology with the need and with the opportunity. And I, I've certainly seen a lot of these requests for proposal where it's like 
you, should, you can, we fund the COVID projects, but only if you use our data center and, you know, you use, you know, it's a little bit like putting a square peg in a round hole. It's like, you know, you have to really make the project fit to whatever the funder wants because they want to have a, a use case for their technology, right? So it's a bit a different goal. But in some areas, um, I think there can be a nice win-win um, situation around this. It really depends. I think it's just doesn't absolve the government to have a good strategy for research funding that is, you know, investigator driven, that's technology agnostic, because really you should have an investigator who goes, this is the question I want to answer, what technologies would fit best to answer that question? It shouldn't be like, here I get this great discount for using this one technology, so I somehow have to figure out a way to, you know, push it into the project. Um, but I think public-private partnership in general can have really good results. It depends on the leadership, though, right? Because it's like herding cats, right? You have very different people with different backgrounds, big initiatives. So that's why I really like the Meningitis A project where they pulled this off beautifully. Um, but it's, it depends on who's running it, too. Yes? Right. Yeah, system change. Yeah, so to repeat the question, do we need really big system change in the healthcare sector? Is it plausible? Would it work? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. It's very difficult to say. Other countries have different systems, so there is researchers that compare all this. Um, I, I think my approach would be, honestly, to start small and fix some of the really outrageous things we could easily fix now and get support and just do it. I, I don't really, I feel sometimes the, the discussion about large system changes holding us back because it's such a great ask, right? You have to break everything and build it from, it, it, it's, I don't know if it's ever going to happen, right? We're very divided right now. I, I think um, it just keeps it, the discussion going. I think some of the worst things are actually really, ba you know, banal, simple things like, um, no, not enough consumer protection, you know. A uh, consumer can't complain anywhere where it really makes a difference about getting false advertising by the insurer, right? Nobody holds them accountable. I mean, these are really simple things. Like, we, we should have uh, an office or an investigator who just can go in with some force and then all this would be solved. Or a lot of these issues would be solved. It wouldn't solve the big issue of, you know, single-payer healthcare or something like that, but I think it's a, um, even now there's many, you know, in my last talk I compared this to, to an engine with a leaking fuel line. We really have five leaks in the fuel line and both parties discuss vigorously how to put more gas into the tank, you know. And that, that's really what the discussion is. How do we fund it? Where should it come from? Da, 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 how can we put the money in? But it's really about how do we fix these leaks too because unless that's fixed, you can never get the engine up and running. So I think taking one step at a time, particularly here in California, you know, where, you know, the government has a two-thirds majority, like, why? And we have a surplus. Like, this stuff should just be done, right? And for some reason, it's not done. And I, I, I mean, I'm not a, a policy major. I don't know why it's not done. But it's like, it's surprising to me as a scientist, for sure, because we, we could make huge difference. It's just there's no lobby or something, but... It, it, there could be a huge difference, for example, allowing Medicaid to use a higher a level um, for what's considered the poverty limit in California. You know, we, we determine the poverty limit based on federal data. I, I dare say that this should be different in South Dakota versus in the Bay Area, right? I mean, it's $18,000. If you make $22,000, you don't qualify for anything in California. You, you just have to see how you buy your drugs from a, a buddy or somebody has a package that's half open, you know, that, that's the reality. So I think um, this, this is stuff we could solve now, right? And this is somehow not on top of the agenda. And I don't really, if anyone has ideas how to get it on the top of the agenda, I would love to hear them um, because it's something we should push for collectively more. But I, to answer your question, I think focusing on the really big goal, on the per, on perfect goal, right, of like, completely beautiful system that we built from scratch, I think sometimes stops us from doing the important issues, fixing important issues we could fix right now. Um, but it's not as, you know, as it, it doesn't really read as well on the front page, you know, but it's, I think these are things we should be doing. Um, 
immediately without, without waiting. More questions? Yes? Mm -hmm. what for new drugs? Okay. Right. Um, so the question is how does FDA determine efficacy of drugs um, and uh, do politics ever, is there a standard measure and do politics affect that? So um, the efficacy is no standard measure. They have standard measures for different diseases. So, like for example, in heart failure, they want to have a functional improvement. So it can't just be imaging of your heart contracting more, but you actually have to show that you walk faster or further, or you have some life change um, that is measurable. Um, it really depends on the disease and totally depends on the influence also. So patient groups can influence this a lot. Right? So we see this a lot, you know, for example, very organized patient groups that do lobbying will definitely get through that, for example, maybe the efficacy standard is a little more lower. Or, uh, because FDA, they, they do want to look at also the situation for patients. So they are more likely to approve something that has a small benefit if there's really no drug at all and people just die. Like in ALS, for example, they approved rilazole, which has uh, a benefit. Yeah. 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 I mean, politics should, you know, shouldn't influence much, but it's, it's, I mean, head of FDA is a politically appointed position, so, I mean, it's certainly integrated. Um, the thing we don't have um, in the United States is uh, an, an institution that actually determines, so FDA just supposed to de define is it safe um, and is it effective, right? And they, they do that with, with the approval, um, but does it really, is it worth paying for is a different question, right? Because that, that is this, this institute, ICER, that does these studies where they really look at, like, relative to the cost of the drug, does it, should it, you know, is this something that moves us forward as a population or is it just marginal, right? Because th there is also a bunch of drugs where the effect is pretty marginal. I mean, you can detect it and it gets approved, but the effect is actually pretty marginal and many patients are, are wise there and, and just say maybe we don't have to take everything that's possible because sometimes the benefit is, is just not worth it. So there's ICER, but ICER makes recommendations and studies, but they're legally non-binding, so, you know. Um, this is something that I, I would say is at the HHS level should be fixed because, we, you know, they, they really, they run CMS also. CMS decides if Medicare reimburses a drug. So the, the, this is, these are levers you could use, but it's a very difficult field, honestly, because sometimes, you know, I mean, where, where do you, this really touches on the question how you quantify the value of human health and human life ultimately, right? So... I'm a bit familiar with the German one where, where they go like this, this buys you so and so many years of quality of life and, and so, but it's, I, I always find it also hard to just have one solid bar for everybody, right? It might be, some people might be willing to put, you know, put more money into this than others, right? I think this is philosophically a very difficult area, you know, but FDA, the endpoints are actually really important and should get more discussions also in some areas because for some diseases you could say they may be a bit fairly strict, right? With other diseases they more lax um, and you know there's a lot of arguments. You have to talk to patients, you have to talk to clinicians who really know like which endpoints are more, most relevant and some endpoints, this is also a, a point most people don't really think about or don't know is that sometimes the endpoints are so qualitative that you can't really get good data. Like we worked on trials for ALS patients and this, this aggregate of things like, can they pick up a pencil? Can they tie their shoelaces? You know, and also everything is self-reported. So if you have very few patients and you have a survey like this as the outcome, I mean, it's almost impossible to show a clear effect of anything, right? Because like depending on if you feel good or bad this morning, you might have a different, you know, you might report differently on your survey. So we much prefer things you can measure, like how the heart beats and so on. But that is very difficult then because FDA doesn't necessarily accept that. So they want to see, 
you to put all the patients on the treadmill and really show they can walk more or longer or something like that. But it's a very good question, and you know, I think is if you're interested in that area, this, this whole it's, it's a lot, a lot more can read about these things and really get into it. The patients' organizations are really into that; they know exactly which endpoints are potentially approvable, how many trials they require also for something to be approved, and then what post-marketing requirements are being put in place by the FDA too. So I always used to think once you got approval, then you're done with the investing, but. Uh, there's also some disease areas where they put very onerous uh, requirements on you after, so you have to actually spend $5 million after um, to do some other studies that they want, and then that can sink. So there's several companies. Um, one actually, um, a Keogen went bankrupt because of this. They developed a new antibiotic, and then because it was a last-line antibiotic, it was barely ever used, and the FDA forced them to do a pediatric study and like other things, and it was so costly, they just went bankrupt, and then we don't have the antibiotic, right? So, uh, so stuff like that, I think they need to be also a bit more practical to see what the situation is. The problem in the pharma sector is that all companies are judged the same by the media and also, you know, because it's actually very different if you pre-revenue and you just kind of really poor, you're just doing your research, or if you're a pharma company who has a lot of money coming in every year, right? So the, the requirements for one, if you say I want to do an additional safety study with, that is costing you 20 million, could be totally doable, and for the other it could m drive you into bankruptcy, right? So there's very little nuance here, I think, in the public discussion, also in the government discussion. So um, that, because you just call everything pharma, right? But fundamentally, they're very different, uh, different companies. How about we have one more question? Yes. Yes, so the question is, um, because it takes so long and the funding requirement, you know, is there a way for companies to fulfill both ethical and investor um, obligations? And I think the answer is yes. Um, sometimes difficult to really gauge from the outside um, what is a significant investment for the ethical obligation, you know, because there's, of course, companies do a lot of stuff and then sometimes the amount they spend is really tiny, you know. But this, so. But I think th there's ways to analyze this. I, I definitely see pharmaceutical companies investing in things um, pro bono a lot. Um, it's definitely true if the people have decision-making authority and they can just do this without uh, asking too many people. Like we have, you know, pro bono projects like you do drug discovery after hours for uh, malaria, sleeping sickness. So I've worked on projects like this because the equipment is already there, the infrastructure is there, right? So you can use it and this, you, know, you can contribute as a do in kind donation to a collaborative projects. For big pharma, also some companies really lead the way in trying to um, develop um, so units that deal particularly with, for example, neglected diseases. Novartis has the Institute for Tropical Disease here in Emeryville, actually, and they fund it and they have a really state-of-the-art, very impressive setup, and they develop malaria drugs, right? So it's, um, so it's definitely possible, and, you know, like that you can do some work that's investor, um, that satisfies the investors and then also mission-oriented uh, work that uh, fulfills your ethical obligation. But I think probably the biggest crunch um, is around pricing there because, you know, you, you do have an ethical obligation to make sure your drug reaches a maximum number of people, but then um, that if it directly influences the bottom line, that's a, a difficult, more difficult thing to pull off in a, on a board level, right? I mean, um, what was she say? The, the, the pricing question there is, is very important. I mean, I, I think it's somewhat encouraging that recently the Biogen um, one with the neurodegenerative disease, they priced too high, particularly given that the effect it had was really marginal. And it, it, it had so much blowback that it really caused a shakeup. I think that was a good lesson, <laughs> lesson learned, because you can just go out there. Um, Gilead had a bunch of blowback for the hepatitis C drug, which I think was almost unjustified because there you get the treatment and you're cured for life, right? So I, I feel the fact that 
that they charged, I don't know what was, 40,000 or something, I think was, was justified for that because it's cured and it's a horrible disease otherwise. And if you compare it to, for example, having simple um, outpatient surgery, actually the price is not that high. Um, so, you know, it's, it's always a bit of a tension, right? I think that what's, what's also influencing this is the general macro environment of finance and um, the philosophy we have. I mean, in the 90s, definitely shareholder value was pushed a lot as, a, as the only reason for, for a company. Um, I think that's even formally untrue, but they kind of use this as a as a fig leaf to say, you know, like we have to, we have to maximize profit because we legally require to maximize profit. It's not really true, but I mean, that's how it was spun. And I, I think we see a little bit of a change now in that thinking too, you know, and um, companies are trying to, um, you know, get, get, make the investors happy, but also, um, you know, do some good. And we also, we see a lot of companies getting involved in global efforts, you know, to curb disease and things like that. I mean, there's a lot of discussion now around the licensing, the TRIPS waiver um, for the global, you know, the vaccine uh, for Africa, for, for COVID. That's very active discussion. It's also a bit of a misleading discussion because they've been discussing that at the World Health Organization for six months and so much fighting. And in the meantime, the U.S. alone has actually discarded 80 million doses of COVID vaccine because it's expired. So to me, practically speaking, I think we're barking completely up the wrong tree here with all these discussions about licensing and IP. I think somebody should have figured out how can we put, how can we pack up close to expired vaccine doses and ship them so we can still get them in arms, right? But that would have been much more impactful. But instead, they, they you know, they talk a lot about IP and these are long-term legal things, you know, it's like, you can't really fix this in, in a month. This will take another year. I mean, by the time they figure that out, probably the vaccine won't really be working anymore against the strains <laughs> that we're facing. So, but this is what's happening on the global political scale, you know. All right. That was a Thank lot. you. That was a and lot. And you have so much to share. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Yay! <laughs> That's awesome. I want to thank her with the Science at Cal shirt. Excellent. So thank you, Julia. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you.